be ready to start now. So I'd like to welcome you all to the final part of our Cape June event, which is the Cape Advanced Technology Lecture. And I'd like to introduce Professor Hannah Joyce, who will be our speaker this afternoon. So Hannah is Professor in Low Dimensional Electronics at the University of Cambridge. She completed her PhD at the Australian National University, followed by a postdoc at the University of Oxford. After joining Cambridge in 2013, she established the Electronic and Photonic Nano Devices Group in Division B, in Engineering Department, I should say. Her group focuses on the development of novel nanomaterials for applications in photonics and electronics. Her interests span the growth of nanowires, terahertz spectroscopy for contact-free characterization of nanomaterials, and the development of new nanomaterial-enabled devices, such as photodetectors and terahertz photo photonic modulators. And her title today is Semiconductor Nanowires, Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so I probably don't need to linger too long on this slide, um, except to say that I'll be hoping to explain how these materials are harder, better, faster, and stronger, and how these properties allow them to be used in electronic and photonic devices. To begin with, and I might just shrink the little screen over here. Let's just start with some definitions of which types of nanowires we're talking about. Specifically, I'll be talking about 3,5 nanowires like gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, gallium nitride. These benefit from the direct band gap and high charge carry mobilities that 3,5 materials usually um, have. Coupled to that is the nanowire geometry, which we usually describe as quasi one dimensional. Um, it's narrow, sometimes narrow enough to actually support quantum confinement effects. And arising from this nanowire geometry are a number of fairly interesting properties. One of those properties is that you can grow nanowires on a highly lattice mismatched substrate. And that's because the narrow diameter of that nanowire allows it to radially expand or contract and thereby accommodate a certain amount of lattice mismatch. This is a huge advantage over conventional planar 3-5 heterojunctions. In a conventional planar sort of heterojunction, what you would find is that lattice mismatch would cause dislocations and other problems that will degrade your device. And nanowires completely overcome this limitation. By that same token, you can incorporate lattice mismatch segments within an axial heterostructure nanowire, that is along the nanowire's length. And you can also move over to the radial heterojunction nanowire. It's a core shell nanowire where you have a core of one material clad in a shell of another material. And that type of radial junction is actually quite important for surface passivation as well. It is also an important device architecture if you're talking about light emitting diodes or solar cells where you want to be able to, in the case of light emitting diodes, inject current across a large area. And that radial junction does give you a large area. Alternatively, in a photodetector or a solar cell, you want to be able to extract your electrons and holes very efficiently. And that large interfacial area supported by the radial junction allows you to do exactly that and extract your charge very effectively. In addition to that, you can have um, interesting photonic effects within arrays of nanowires. An array of nanowires can support, for instance, waveguide modes in the plane of the array um, and can also give rise to sub-wavelength scattering and multiple reflections, which ultimately improve your absorption within that nanowire array. And we see that often in our samples where if you look at your sample of nanowires standing up vertically, they, they appear to, to the naked eye as just very, very black. They're absorbing very, very well. A single nanowire on its own can also support um, waveguide modes and exhibit me resonances, which further enhance absorption, or in the case of waveguide modes, can in fact permit um, effects like lasing in single nanowires. A further interesting effect is polarization and isotropy. Now, these nanowires are quasi one dimensional and have this linear shape. What that ultimately translates to is polarization and isotropy when we're looking at electric fields. Specifically, if an electric field is aligned parallel to the axis of the nanowire, that is the long axis of the nanowire, the electric field will usually penetrate that nanowire 
unchanged. On the other hand, if your electric field is aligned perpendicular to the long axis of the nanowire, it tends to be suppressed substantially within the nanowire. You can derive the, um, the sort of the factor that explains how much your electric field is suppressed, and you can derive that just by solving Maxwell's equations, which I won't do now. Um, so I'll just state this as a fact, um, but this is an effect that we will be exploiting when we move on to our terahertz polarization modulators. And finally, we have a very high elastic failure limit and a very high stiffness in our nanowires. What that means is that with these nanowires, you can really bend them quite far elastically and then they'll spring back. And the Young's modulus is very, very high. So this is where the, the harder in my title comes from. And the stronger comes from the fact that you can bend these nanowires substantially before they ultimately snap. And they bend elastically until they snap. Um, so the Young's modulus and that elastic failure limit are both considerably higher in the nanowires than they would be in a conventional 3.5 film. And this is a further thing that we're trying to exploit in our devices. And so nanowires as sort of nanoscale components have a wide variety of applications, some of them potential applications, some of them close to commercialization. For instance, in light emitting diodes, um, there are a couple of companies working on micro LEDs based on nanowires. Um, and so the particular things that I want to dwell on, the particular applications will be flexible electronics, um, quantum information and terahertz photonics, but we dabble in all the other areas as well. It's useful to understand how we actually create these nanowires. And here I outline three different growth mechanisms that we use to grow the nanowires. The first is the vapor liquid solid growth mechanism. And in this case, you'll note that there's a little blob at the tip of the nanowire. That's a gold nanoparticle, which is responsible for catalyzing the growth via this mechanism. So what we do with this mechanism is we sprinkle gold nanoparticles on our semiconductor substrate, and then we place this substrate decorated with gold nanoparticles into our reactor and expose it to the precursors. For instance, trimethyl gallium and arsine. These precursors are delivered in the vapor phase and they decompose. The gallium then alloys with that gold nanoparticle. At a certain point, the gold nanoparticle becomes supersaturated with gallium. At that point, the gallium starts to precipitate out of the nanoparticle. It precipitates out at the interface between the nanoparticle and the semiconductor and thereby drives the anisotropic growth of our nanowire. The nanoparticle itself um, is usually assumed to be in a liquid phase. And that's because at the growth temperature, when you alloy your nanoparticle with the gallium, you have a gold gallium alloy, which usually um, is melted below, so melted um, and has a temperature above the eutectic liquid temperature. So we end up with a liquid phase in that nanoparticle and the nanowire itself is a solid. And that's why it's termed the vapor liquid solid growth mechanism, simply because we've got these three phases. The alternative approach is to use select barrier epitaxy where we have holes patterned within a dielectric mask and then the nanowires selectively nucleate and grow from the holes in that dielectric mask. And finally, the silane assisted growth mode, which works specifically for nitride materials. In this case, we co-deliver silane gas as we're growing the nanowires a silicon nitride layer spontaneously forms on the surface of the nanowire, which actually prevents deposition on the surfaces of the nanowire, ultimately driving the anisotropic growth in a single direction on the C plane of that nanowire. Okay, and so a lot of the growth that's been done in this particular talk was performed by Jenny Zhang, who was my postdoc, and uh, she's recently moved back to Australia. I've vaguely divided the talk into three different sections um, to give you a flavor of the different challenges we have to overcome when working with these materials and the potential they offer in various applications. So firstly, let's have a look at nanowire surfaces. 
As you'll all appreciate, these nanowires have a very high surface area to volume ratio. And this can be a desirable thing if you're, for instance, using your nanowire as a kind of sensor to the absorbent, you know, species absorbing on the surface of the nanowire, but it can also have deleterious properties. Um, so for instance, what we're going to show here is one of the problems that can occur when we have this very high surface area to volume ratio. So here we're looking at negative photoconductivity in indium arsenide nanowires. What we start out with is a very standard field effect transistor kind of um, device where we have our nanowires transferred onto a silicon substrate that's p-type doped um, and there's a silicon dioxide um, gate oxide layer. We pattern on our source and drain electrodes which are both nickel which gives an okay ohmic contact to the nanowire and then we do a standard field effect transistor measurement. But what we noticed was that there wasn't very strong effect when we turned on the light. Now Normally, with a semiconductor, you would expect that you turn on um, incident illumination. If that illumination is above the band gap of your semiconductor, you expect it to generate electrons and holes, which should improve the conductivity of your semiconductor. But in our indium arsenide nanowire field effect transistors, we saw the exact opposite effect. And our source drain current dropped dramatically. So this negative photoconductivity was really significant and it was also long lived so that when we switched that light off again, the conductivity failed to recover. So this was ultimately what we decided was a bit of a problem. We could try to sell it as a long lived optical memory effect because it is indeed very, very long lived. Um, but on the other hand, Generally for photonic devices, this is something that you don't want to happen and you don't want your electronics to be behaving differently when you turn the light on. To explain the effect, it's useful to consider the nature of the surface states um, associated with this indium arsenide nanowire and contrast that with gallium arsenide, which is an archetypal semiconductor that's plagued by surface states. So, um, John, we'll see there's a reference to one of your papers, very useful paper. <laughs> um, now, in the case of gallium arsenide, we have surface states that lie within the band gap, and these are responsible for non-radiative recombination via shockley reed hall type processes. However, in indium arsenide, there are surface states lying quite high up in the conduction band. And it's these surface states that we believe are responsible for this negative photoconductivity effect. You can see um, what the native oxide looks like if you do a transmission electron microscope measurement. Um, you can see this amorphous area here, which is associated with the native oxide on our indium arsenide nanowires. And so we believe that uh, these surface states are associated with that defective native oxide. So the mechanism that we postulate is that initially in these nanowires, there are electrons present um, with a fairly high density at the bottom of the conduction band. And they're present because of band bending towards the surface um, and there's a surface accumulation layer as a, as a result of Fermi level pinning at the surface of the nanowire. And then when you photo excite, you introduce both electrons and holes and we're photo exciting well above the band gap of indium arsenide, which is about 0.35 electron volts. That means that the electrons and holes that we inject are pretty hot. And those hot electrons then get trapped in these surface states associated with the native oxide. At the same time, the holes that have been photo excited will recombine with those electrons in the channel which ultimately degrades the conductivity. You still have electrons present, but they're stuck in those surface states. So this is what we postulate is reducing the conductivity when we photo excite. We've actually been able to mitigate this effect substantially by doing passivation. To passivate our nanowires, we deposit um, alumina by atomic layer deposition. And that firstly has an effect of passivating silanol groups associated with the silicon dioxide gate dielectric. 
It also acts as a barrier against atmospheric effects, such as the adsorption of um, water and other things in the atmosphere. Finally, and possibly most importantly, um, the deposition of this alumina, in fact, chemically reduces the native oxide. The deposition of alumina is achieved via um, introducing trimethyl aluminium and water as precursors, and that trimethyl aluminium actually acts as a reducing agent that in, in many cases can get rid of the native oxide or at least reduce the density of surface states in that native oxide. By doing this, we're able to remove that negative photoconductivity effect and also improve the field effect mobility of these transistors significantly. You'll also notice that there's a much reduced hysteresis in this um, transconductance curve for our passivated, that is encapsulated devices. As a, another quite interesting um, perspective, it's useful to think about what the facets actually are as these nanowires grow. And so here I want to show you some data obtained by my postdoc Jenny once again, where she was lucky enough to be able to cross section our nanowires at the interface between the gold and the underlying nanowire. And what she observed was quite interesting because we have our gallium arsenide nanowire underneath. Well, sorry, we have our, yeah, so our gallium arsenide nanowire underneath, which you can see in um, outlined in the orange. And then plonked on top of that is the gold nanoparticle with a roughly spherical kind of shape. Um, so here you see these two cross sections and you'll notice that the gallium arsenide nanowire doesn't have a circular type of cross section. In fact, it's adopting this shape, which we call a rouleau triangle. It has an elongated, three elongated sides and three much shorter sides. The elongated sides are associated with 112A facets. So crystallographically speaking, these two facets, the 112A and the 112B facets, they are chemically different. One of them has more of an arsenic termination. The other has more of a, a gallium termination. It's in fact the 112A facets that tend to have a more gallium rich character and the 112B facets that have the more arsenic rich character. And the balance of these two facets is determined by the growth conditions. But what's interesting is that we don't see nice flat facets. We see curved facets, which are generally associated with a very high surface energy. Clearly the gold nanoparticle as it's catalyzing the growth of these nanowires is actually causing some very non-equilibrium facets in the underlying gallium arsenide nanowire as a result of surface tension. And so what's interesting though, is that if we anneal these nanowires by heating them up and allowing their cross section to reform, we in fact see the occurrence of some very different cross sections, in this case, 110, um, facets arise and these 110 facets um, have a non-polar type of characteristic. So what's interesting then is to think, okay, we've got these two facets and we can to an extent control what facets we have, which are actually better from a device perspective. We know that these that there can be a lot of surface recombination and wacky effects that take place at these surfaces. You know, what is actually better? So what we did was we did a bunch of annealing experiments and in parallel, we did photoluminescence experiments on those annealed nanowires. For the photoluminescence measurements, we usually tried to cap the nanowires with an aluminium gallium arsenide shell. What you see with these annealing experiments is that there is a transition to the 110 facets. And that transition is more complete at the tip of the nanowire. It's less complete at the base, which firstly has a larger diameter. So you would require more atoms to move yeah. in order to create the equilibrium 110 facets. Um, after passivating these nanowires with an aluminium gallium arsenide shell, we actually observed that there was a difference in the optoelectronic quality of the nanowires depending on the position along the nanowire. 
and depending on whether the facets had transformed to 110 or not. And in fact, the 110 interfaces were associated with much brighter photoluminescence, um, meaning that there is likely to be a much lower interfacial recombination velocity at, that one, at those 110 facets. Whereas the 112 facets were not as good as the 110 facets, which points us in the direction that we should always try to achieve these 110 facets to get nanowires with the highest quantum efficiency. So now we can move on to electrical characterization. We've spoken about the nanowires and we've looked at them so far by scanning electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy and photoluminescence measurements. What about their electrical measurements? Um, you know, when we attach our source and drain contacts and measure electronic properties. One option for investigating the electronic properties of a nanowire would be to use a standard Hall effect type of measurement. In this case, we'd have a source and a drain electrode. We'd apply a magnetic field and we'd measure the Hall voltage across lateral side contacts. The difficulty with this type of measurement comes from those lateral side contacts. It is actually remarkably difficult to make lateral side contacts to a structure that is effectively one dimensional. And there are a number of papers that have taken this approach of doing Hall effect measurements, but they come with alarming titles such as the impact of invasive metal probes on Hall measurements. And so Hall measurements, whilst they have their place, are, are littered with um, pitfalls where you really do have to be very wary of what you're doing. The other measurement I've already spoken about, which is the field effect transistor measurement, where we have our source and our drain and our back gate voltage applied to the silicon substrate that's p-doped. Okay. But in each case, this requires a fair bit of um, device fabrication. It requires even lithography, which is not cheap. Um, and it does require you to be very aware of what kinds of artifacts will arise. In the case of the field effect transistor measurements, you also have to make some fairly substantial assumptions as to what the gate oxide capacitance is. Um, that gate oxide capacitance tends to be in the range of sort of femtofarads, which is really not very easy to measure experimentally. And if you don't know that capacitance into all of your all of your measurements and results in a fairly substantial systematic uncertainty. What we do in my lab to kind of complement um, these contact-based techniques is electrical characterization with an entirely contact-free technique, which is terahertz conductivity spectroscopy. Briefly, it relies on this terahertz frequency band, which lies between the microwave and the infrared in the electromagnetic spectrum. And by using this terahertz frequency band, we're able to do these conductivity methods or conductivity measurements in a way that's contact free and allows us to characterize a whole bunch of properties that are extremely important for devices. Things like carrier mobility, the charge carrier trapping and recombination rates and the doping. The fundamental concept behind terahertz time domain spectroscopy is that it's measuring the absorption of terahertz photons through a sample. So you have a terahertz pulse and then you measure its transmission through the sample. The terahertz frequency band consists of photons that have pretty low energies. We're talking energies of about the order of one milli electron volt. Sorry, point, yeah. Yeah, one milli electron volt, so 0.4 to 40 milli electron volts. And so in this case, we have these very, very small photon energies that are not sufficient to actually photo excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. But these photons do have enough energy to cause our electrons and holes that are already existing and in mobile states. These photons can cause those electrons and holes to move around. In fact, the terahertz pulse is best viewed as a slowly varying electric field. And that electric field is causing electrons and holes already in the sample to move under its influence. And that motion ultimately absorbs the terahertz electric field, causing the attenuation of the transmitted terahertz pulse. So ultimately, 
we have a situation where the absorption of that terahertz pulse is directly proportional to the conductivity of the sample. Optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy is an extension of this technique, whereby we first photo excite the sample with an above band gap pulse that introduces electrons and holes, which then render the, the sample conductive. And then we pass our terahertz probe through the sample. The photo excitation of those electrons and holes makes that sample conductive, as I already said. Um, and because that sample is now conductive, it will absorb the terahertz probe. So photo excitation will cause a change in the transmission of that terahertz probe. And that change in terahertz transmission is directly proportional to the photoconductivity of the sample. Another useful thing to note is that we can change the time between photo excitation and the arrival of our terahertz pulse. Having a bit of time elapse between photo excitation and the arrival of the terahertz pulse means that you've given your electrons and holes a chance to recombine before the terahertz pulse arrives. By modifying this time, this pump probe delay, we're actually able to track how the electron and hole population changes as a function of time after photo excitation. And so we end up with two different types of measurements. The first measurement is what we call a photoconductivity spectrum. Here we plot the real and imaginary parts of the photoconductivity as a function of frequency. And this type of measurement allows us to extract parameters like the scattering rate, the charge carry mobility, the charge carry density, and so on. We have another type of measurement, which is the decay curve. And this shows us how the conductivity of the sample decays as a function of time after photo excitation. This allows us to extract parameters like the lifetimes of the charge carriers, surface recombination velocities, and so on. And this is just a picture from the lab where you can see part of the experimental apparatus. Inside that metal box is our terahertz generation and detection system. Um, the beauty of the metal box is that we can evacuate it or purge it with a nitrogen atmosphere, um, which is beneficial for these terahertz measurements because there are very strong water vapor absorption lines in the terahertz region um, if you just leave everything under ambient conditions. So we get rid of those water vapor absorption lines by evacuating the chamber. To give you an example of how we apply this technique, I'll show you some of Stephanie's results comparing um, indium arsenide phosphide nanowires that have either been passivated with a high band gap shell or have not been passivated. In the green, we have our indium arsenide phosphide shells. So indium arsenide phosphide nanowires that are bare, that is unpassivated. And you can see that these are associated with a fairly rapid decay in photoconductivity. On the other hand, if we passivate these nanowires with an indium phosphide shell, we in fact see a lengthening of the charge carrier lifetime, which means that our carriers are able to live longer inside the nanowire and are not recombining so rapidly at the surface because of the passivation provided by that indium phosphide high band gap shell. And this works because indium phosphide itself has a very low surface recombination velocity. So even if a charge carrier is lucky enough to escape the indium arsenide phosphide core and reach the surface of the indium phosphide shell, it will encounter a surface that itself has a very low surface recombination velocity. So that, that charge carrier is likely to live another day, or not another day, another like peak a second or so. <laughs> but, um, so. We also compared our photoconductivity spectra, and here you can see the photoconductivity spectra for both bare and passivated nanowires. The photoconductivity spectra can be fitted with a drude lorentz type response, um, which describes the nature of the plasmonic conduction taking place within those nanowires. By fitting this type of response, we're able to extract device-relevant parameters such as the charge carrier scattering rate 
and the carrier density N. The carrier density N is related to the number of photoexcited electrons and holes and also related to the doping that's already existing in those nanowires. The scattering rate gamma is related to the scattering mechanisms um, that the electrons encounter as they travel within our nanowires. So by fitting these spectra with a drude lorentz response, we can extract the scattering rate and then convert that to an electron mobility. The electron mobility that we end up extracting for both the bare and passivated nanowires is about 3000 centimeters squared per volt per second. What we were expecting was that the passivated nanowires would in fact have a higher electron mobility. And unfortunately they didn't. But it sort of makes sense if we consider that our passivated nanowires also experience a bit of strain. There is lattice mismatch between that shell and the underlying indium arsenide phosphide core, which is causing that core to be compressively strained, um, ultimately degrading the mobility of these carriers. So the last part of my talk is device integration. Um, and here I'll try and show you some solutions um, that we've come up with to address the fact that these nanowires are not sort of simple things like planar semiconductors that you can just pop a contact on the top and the bottom of. And also at the same time, trying to address the fact that these nanowires find applications in very unconventional areas, such as in um, quantum information and so on. So with this first example of the quantum multiplexer, we were trying to address the problem that when you do measurements at cryogenic temperatures, you have to get a whole bunch of wires into your, your cryostat. And you have to have the right number of wires for the number of devices that you're trying to measure. Um, and that, that is limited sometimes because every wire that you add to a cryostat costs you extra money. And sometimes just because every time you introduce an extra wire into your cryostat, you're also introducing a path for heat to come in and ruin your cryogenic temperatures. So what we've done is try to introduce a type of multiplexer that allows us to measure these devices um, with a minimum number of contacts, that is a minimum number of wires entering the cryostat. The multiplexer is actually based on a two-dimensional electron gas, and it uses that two-dimensional electron gas as a conducting path. And this work was sort of started by Charles Smith and Michael Kelly um, and Luke Smith, who was a postdoc um, and is now leading his own group, and Carve Del Farnazari, who is also leading his own group now. Now, what is this two-dimensional electron gas? Well, to make a two-dimensional electron gas, we have to make a stack of um, semiconductor. We'll have a substrate, then we'll have a gallium arsenide channel, and then on top of that, an aluminium gallium arsenide layer. And on top of that, another aluminium gallium arsenide layer, but this top layer is doped N-type. The clever thing about this is that it creates a band structure that you can see here, or an approximate band structure that you can see here. And what you can see is even in this undoped gallium arsenide channel, there's a place where the conduction band dips below the Fermi level. And in that place, we get a two-dimensional electron gas. That means a very high density of electrons will exist at that interface between the gallium arsenide and the aluminium gallium arsenide. So why is that two-dimensional electron gas any better than anything else? Well, it's because the you have no deliberate dopants existing in that area. The dopants that have delivered those electrons to the two-dimensional electron gas, those dopants actually exist in the endote aluminium gallium arsenide, which is really remote compared to our channel where the two-dimensional electron gas is. So what we've really done is removed these dopants um, and the scattering that those dopants would cause, allowing a very high mobility 
within our two-dimensional electron gas, very high conductivity. And so this two-dimensional electron gas is the foundation for our multiplexer. We then etch it out to create a bunch of cascading channels. So now our two-dimensional electron gas exists as a kind of MESA and then fabricate the source and drain contacts to our two-dimensional electron gas. We also have a back contact, which is contacting the substrate underneath, and that allows us to um, sort of back contact um, and you then do field effect transistor measurements. Then we deposit a layer of insulator. It's usually alumina deposited by atomic layer deposition. And then we etch some holes within that layer. And then finally, we put on some top gates. So those top gates will be touching parts of this two-dimensional electron gas. The parts that they'll be touching are the bits where there's no insulator where the insulator has been removed by etching. And if you were to apply a bias to one of those top gates, um, for instance, if you were to apply a negative bias to the top gate, that would selectively deplete the two-dimensional electron gas wherever that insulator layer is missing. If the insulator layer is still there, then your gate is sufficiently remote from your two-dimensional electron gas so that your 2-deg is not depleted. So this actually gives us a mechanism with which we can selectively deplete arms of this channel and then selectively contact or address particular devices within this multiplexer. So for example, this multiplexer that we see here has eight outputs and we've got our two-dimensional electron gas um, and then you can see the gates applied to the two-dimensional electron gas. Wherever you see a sort of gray block, um, that corresponds to a layer of alumina that's separating the gate from the two-dimensional electron gas. So in this case, for example, we're thinking of the gates initially being off. Now, what happens next if we were to actually apply a bias to some of these gates? So for instance, here, we've applied a bias to gate number six. So by applying a bias to gate number six, we are depleting the two-dimensional electron gas in paths two, four, six, and eight, which ultimately means that the source at the top will only be connected to paths one, three, five, and seven whereas outputs two, four, and six, and eight are disconnected from that source. Now, if we then applied biases to gates two, four, and six, we would select one particular path, which is the path from the source to device number one. And that then allows us to selectively address whatever it is that exists at device number one. Now this method is scalable. Um, so as we increase the number of contacts, we actually um, are able to address more and more devices with the dependence that's equal to two to the open bracket n minus one close bracket divided by two. Okay. And so you don't really see the advantage so much when we're only talking about eight devices, but as you scale this up, you're able to um, sort of exponentially contact more devices with a certain number of electrodes. And then what Luke um, and also Tom, um, who is a postdoc in my group, were doing was they were investigating how different 2D materials and nanowires can be integrated into this multiplexer in order to measure the properties of these devices. And not just measure them at room temperature, but measure them at cryogenic temperatures at which we hope to be able to observe interesting quantum mechanical phenomena. To get the nanowires actually into this channel, we relied on our colleagues and collaborators at the University of Strathclyde who have this very elegant transfer printing technique where they can pick up a nanowire, a single nanowire, on a specially shaped PDMS stamp and then deposit that nanowire into the channel on our multiplexer. <laughs> 
So then with this technique, we were able to measure multiple individual nanowires at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and here you see some of the data. So this type of um, method is very, very useful and it allows us to address individual nanowires. At the same time, we're working on a parallel project, which is automated device microscopy and design. And this work was largely led by Jack Alexander Weber. Now, the PhD students, particularly in my group, will know that creating these field effect transistor devices can be laborious um, and time consuming. And, you know, the supervisor might not care how much time a PhD student is wasting, but the PhD students definitely care. <laughs> so what, what Jack and Taya um, have done is create a method for automating quite a large fraction of this device process particularly allowing the machine to identify the nanowires rather than a PhD student, allowing the machine, in fact, to do the real guts of the, um, of the fabrication, particularly the electron microscopy, identifying those nanowires, aligning the, the electrodes to those nanowires and designing the devices, ultimately outputting a CAD file that can be read by the e-beam lithography system. And so the PhD student just sort of needs to be there to take the sample from one place to another. <laughs> um, okay. In order to do this, Jack and Taya and Peter Christopher, um, they de de designed a new type of alignment marker. Firstly, they tried a bunch of pre-existing alignment markers like QR codes, Apple tags, um, you know, the lot and found that none of these particular types of fiducial alignment markers were particularly good for lithographic processing. There are a whole lot of problems associated with the enclosed areas in these designs, um, which caused problems with liftoff, um, which then meant that it, they were not reproducible or not machine readable. So alternatively, what they came up with was a different type of alignment marker called a lithotag which is optimized for lithography and allows the machine to um, locate alignment targets with a sort of resolution down to a few nanometers. Um, and so this type of alignment marker is much, much better than the alternative machine readable alignment markers and also much better than what humans tend to use, which is just a selection of sort of crosses with numbers. Um, which tends not to be that easy for the machine to actually read, particularly when the lithography has gone wrong. A, hu a human can usually interpret what a weird number is, but the machine is not so good at that. Whereas these alignment tags are very, very useful. So using this system, they were able to contact a large number of devices, more than 200 devices very, very rapidly, not just simple source drain electrodes, but also intermediate electrodes and side electrodes and we're able to actually obtain field effect transistor um, figures of merit, like the on-off ratio and threshold voltage um, across a wide variety of devices with different channel lengths. The other advantage of this technique is that it sort of takes out the human bias. Um, so we know that these this is a very rigorous study where it's not just that a PhD student says, well, that, that, that device looks pretty nice, so I'll measure it. And then that one looks pretty nice, I'll measure it. These, these are all of the devices um, without being sort of pre-screened by subjective people. Um, the last example comes to nanowires for terahertz devices. I've described how we use terahertz techniques to characterize our nanowires. Now we sort of come full circle and use our nanowires to make terahertz band devices. And the terahertz region of the electromagnetic spectrum is pretty interesting for a wide variety of applications. Some of those being industrial quality control type of applications. There are also security applications like in the airport. You know how at the airport you go and you can either walk through the, the X-ray scanner which is blasting you with a bunch of x-rays. Or you can go in that, um, that sort of cylindrical thing where they stand there and they make you put your feet on the, the feet marks and you put your arms in the air. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a terahertz scanner. It's, an, it's a millimeter wave scanner. It's very, very safe because millimeter waves are non-ionizing radiation, unlike x-rays. Um, 
Terra Hertz region, it's also very useful for 6G communication um, applications, um, particularly because at the moment, the terahertz region of the electromagnetic spectrum is unallocated. And so what we're trying to do here is make a device that we can use to modulate the polarization of our terahertz. Um, and this device we anticipate, you know, we use for communications, but also useful for any application where you want to be able to control the polarization of your terahertz radiation. And this device is based on the wire grid polarizer, which is a pretty standard old fashioned device consisting of an array of metallic wires. And this device operates as, as follows. We have an incident beam, which will have a particular arbitrary polarization. It hits this wire grid polarizer and what's transmitted is the component of that electric field that is polarized perpendicular to these wires. And so what we seek to do here is replace our metallic wires with semiconducting wires, our gallium arsenide um, nanowires, for instance, which have the benefit of being very conductive after photo excitation. And also that, that photoconductivity is very, very short lived um, because of the very short lifetime of the charge carriers involved, which ultimately means that we should be able to switch these polarizers on and off very quickly because we can switch their conductivity on and off very quickly. To give you an idea of what actually happens when we have a bunch of nanowires lined up for one of these terahertz devices, let's consider the photoconductivity spectra of these nanowires. If we photo excite the nanowires with a photo excitation pulse polarized parallel to the long axis of the nanowires, what you see is a very strong photoconductivity response. Um, on the other hand, if we photo excite with a pulse that's polarized perpendicular to the nanowires, we see basically minimal conductivity. And that's because our pulse perpendicular to the nanowires is not effective at photo exciting the nanowires because its electric field is suppressed inside the nanowires. So this means that there is some polarization and isotropy that's very significant that we can exploit with our nanowires. And additionally, I want to show you the photoconductivity decay curve associated with gallium arsenide nanowires, where you can see that the photoconductivity rises very sharply after photo excitation and then decays um, very significantly within about 10 picoseconds. So this is just to summarize, this is the origin of our polarization and isotropy, the fact that the electric field is suppressed if it's polarized perpendicular to the nanowires. We have our array of nanowires that's highly aligned. And we also have these fancy um, properties associated with the mechanics of these nanowires, particularly that high elastic failure limit and that very high stiffness, which we're going to exploit in these devices. So what we're gonna do with these devices is in fact, peel them off the growth substrate whilst maintaining their parallel alignment. In order to do that, we embed the nanowires in a conformal transparent polymer, um, which is deposited by a vacuum deposition technique. And that, po that polymer is known as Paraline C. And it's very, very nice because it maintains the alignment of these nanowires. And then you can peel the polymer containing the nanowires off your growth substrate, which then gives you a standalone film of these nanowires in polymer where these nanowires are retaining that beautiful parallel alignment with one another. And then we can actually laminate multiple sheets of these nanowires together using a hot bonding process. In this case, we heat the paraline up to just above its glass transition temperature, which allows um, multiple sheets of paraline to be bonded together and we apply a small amount, well, 20 bar of pressure in order to really stick these sheets together. And then with this polarizer, we're able to measure how the terahertz transmission changes as a function of photo excitation polarization. 
And so what you see here is in fact that we're able to modulate the terahertz transmission quite significantly by photo excitation um, depending on the polarization of that photo excitation pulse. So you can see that if we photo excite um, at zero degrees, that is with a photo excitation pulse polarized parallel to the long axis of the nanowires, we get a marked attenuation in transmission as a result of the nanowires being photo excited very effectively. On the other hand, if we photo excite with um, light polarized perpendicular to the axis of the nanowires, we see only very minimal attenuation of transmission. So this gives us a knob that we can tune to control the, um, the well, to modulate the terahertz pulse. And then finally, it's important to note that we can modulate this very rapidly because the nanowires um, are photo excited within femtoseconds. And then that photoconductivity decay is extremely rapid in gallium arsenide nanowires. We also see that we can increase the modulation depth that we achieve just by increasing the number of layers in this polarizer. There's another thing that's quite interesting. I've mentioned how we've been able to harvest these nanowires from the substrate by embedding in paraline and peeling them off. What's useful to look at is the substrate that's left behind. In this case, you can see the substrate and you can see little holes. So those are the holes in the mask where the nanowires nucleated from. We've taken this substrate back and tried to grow another array of nanowires. And indeed we are able to grow another array of nanowires on this exact same substrate. This method is ultimately giving us a means to recycle or reuse the growth substrate, which in itself is fairly expensive, not just because it's a 3-5 growth substrate, but because these holes have been patterned by e-beam lithography. On a completely different note, Paraline has been really useful for another application, and this is work performed by Virgil Andre in Erwin Reissner's group. Um, and we, we helped them out by coating some of their devices um, in Paraline to make them waterproof. Now these devices are water splitting devices to make solar fuels, um, hydrogen um, in particular. But we needed to encapsulate certain parts of this device because those certain parts um, would degrade quite strong quite quickly if they came into contact with water and paraline it turned out was a really perfect way to encapsulate this to block out the water um, and it's because it's so thin and has pinhole free it doesn't add significantly to the weight of the device so you can see that these devices in fact float on on the river cam and so to summarize here are some of the things we've discussed. We've discussed how nanowire surfaces affect the properties of nanowires. We've discussed how we use terahertz conductivity spectroscopy to characterize the nanowires. And we've discussed various ways to integrate those nanowires um, into devices. And with that, I'd like to thank a whole lot of people. Um, this is a very non-exhaustive list um, and I need to make a new group photo so that the newer members of the group um, <laughs> are in it, um, particularly I and Maria. Um, and that's basically it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Anna, do we have any questions? No? It's all right. Anybody online? There's, oh, there's one chat, the but they're chat. probably saying, I can't hear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, there is, <laughs> there is a chat. Okay. Okay. One question about the terahertz conductivity measurement of the dope gallium arsenide nanowires. With the advent of scattering type of scanning in near field optical microscopy, SNOM, what do you envisage the potential novel insight from terahertz conductivity retrieved from an individual nanowire at the nanoscale compared with the terahertz conductivity retrieved from a typical measurement? Yeah, yeah. And SNOM methods are particularly powerful. Um, they're also very, very difficult to do um, because there's a, the signal that you get is, is very, very weak. Um, so it's still a really active area of research, um, trying to figure out the best way to do 
terahertz scattering SNOM me measurements in order to get clean enough data that you can actually interpret it. Um, so doing ensemble measurements has a lot of merit because you don't have to worry about signal to noise problems quite so much. Um, and I think SNOM measurements need to kind of take place at the same time to really reveal that intra nanowire um, kind of dynamics. Yep. Okay, if we have no other questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you for attending. We'll see you all at the next Cape event, which will be in October. Date to be announced.